Thank you for this opportunity to participate in Society for Science of Clinical Psychology's virtual clinical lunch series. Today I'm going to be talking to you about work that our lab has been doing to try to change threat interpretations to reduce anxiety. Our lab is the PACT lab, the program for anxiety, cognition, and treatment. And we're really interested in how people think differently when they're anxious and how that matters for the onset of anxiety difficulties and critically for their reduction. And we tend to scare people a lot in our studies, and so Halloween is big in our lab, hence the photo. Today I want to talk to you about a problem that we believe is a very serious one facing the field, which is that people are not getting the treatments that they need. So despite the fact that many, many people are suffering with mental illnesses, a great many are not getting good treatment. We want to talk to you about something that we think could be part of that solution, which is bringing treatment to them directly. And in particular, computer-based interpretation training. And we'll tell you about some of the initial work that we've done in this area, the progress we're making, but also some of the challenges that we've been facing and some of the next steps we're doing to try to address these challenges. One of the really nice things about being a psychologist who studies fear and anxiety disorders is that pretty much everyone you meet can kind of relate in some way or another to what you do. So whether I'm at a cocktail party or riding on an airplane or at the hairdresser, people will tell me stories about their or their family members' experiences with anxiety. And that's something I actually really enjoy. I feel privileged that people are willing to share their stories with me, and I love the work that I do, so I find it really fascinating. There's an aspect of this, though, that I find somewhat heartbreaking. I will often hear stories that I think are pretty upsetting. For example, someone will tell me about their Aunt Leora. Leora's had panic attacks for about the last 10 years. Sudden onset of symptoms that rise to a peak in about 10 minutes, where she has heart racing, sweats, and she feels absolute terror, a sense of imminent dread that something awful is going to happen. A heart attack, she'll pass out, she could die. And these attacks really terrify her. And she started to avoid all kinds of situations where she fears she could have some of these symptoms. So she used to love to go to the movies and love to go to concerts. But now she doesn't want to be in crowded situations where escape could be difficult if she starts to experience these panic symptoms. So she now has both panic disorder and agoraphobia. And as a result, her life has gotten smaller and smaller. She goes out less and spends more and more time at home. About five years ago, she worked up the courage to tell her primary care physician about what was going on and her doctor gave her a prescription for a heavy sedative. Unfortunately, though, the side effects were so strong that she soon stopped taking them because they caused all kinds of impairment in their own right. And now Leora is not getting any treatment and is really spending more and more time at home. I'll also hear stories about somebody's best friend, Rick. Rick is a really nice guy, really talented, but he has social anxiety disorder. So he fears negative evaluation from others and avoids situations where he fears that somebody might scrutinize his performance. In particular, he finds public speaking really difficult. His work, though, involves public speaking. So Rick works in marketing, and it involves him making presentations. Initially, he avoided the opportunities to do that, and as a result, was skipped over for a promotion he otherwise would have gotten. Unfortunately, as this avoidance continued, and he did more and more of sort of skipping these kinds of opportunities in his work, he eventually lost his job. Now Rick lives in a small town and there's not a lot of providers around who offer the best available treatment for social anxiety disorder, who offer cognitive behavioral therapy. So Rick is now getting no treatment and because of losing his job, he has very minimal resources and no money that would allow him to seek treatment. And I find these stories so upsetting because at their root, it means we are not getting evidence-based care to the people who need it. In other words, we are not getting the treatments that have the best research support to the millions of people who are suffering with mental illness. Critically, this is not a small problem. So these disorders are highly prevalent. In the United States, about 50% of the population is projected to meet criteria for a mental illness diagnosis at some point in their lifetime. And specific to anxiety disorders, what we're talking about today, depending on the study you look at, anywhere from 18 to 36 percent of the population will have an anxiety disorder at some point. To put this in perspective, if you look around the room that you're in, that means one in every four or five people is going to experience 
clinically significantly impairing anxiety in their lifetime. And it's not a small thing to have an anxiety disorder or to have any kind of mental illness. They come with enormous personal and financial costs. So for people with anxiety disorders, they are less likely to have occupational success, more likely to have problems in their academic functioning, more problems in their relationship, and reduced quality of life, and even higher risk for suicide. From a financial standpoint, we see enormous costs, more than $190 billion annually in just lost earnings due to major mental illnesses. And specific, oh, to put this in perspective, that is essentially the same as the GDP for the entire country of New Zealand. And that's just referring to the lost earnings. Specific to anxiety disorders, about $42 billion is spent every year in the United States on healthcare expenditures for anxiety. And part of why this is so upsetting and is costing so much is we are not getting treatment to the people who need it. So fewer than one in three people who are suffering with a mental illness in the United States is receiving treatment for that mental illness. And the rates are even lower among minority populations. Again, specific to anxiety disorders, again, around that one third is receiving treatment. But an even smaller percentage is getting what we would call minimally adequate treatment. In other words, getting an adequate dose of a treatment that has been found to likely be effective for the problem area. Only 13% of those who have this an anxiety disorder diagnosis are getting that treatment. And part of what is so upsetting about this is that we actually know a lot about what can help people with anxiety difficulties. So for example, cognitive behavioral therapies for anxiety disorders are the gold standard treatment. They involve a variety of different approaches, but what's common across these approaches is that they help people to reduce their negative catastrophic thinking. So the idea for Rick that people are going to evaluate him negatively. And for Leora, the idea that there's signs of a racing heart and symptoms of panic mean something terrible is happening, like she's going to have a heart attack. And also these treatments help people to reduce the avoidance behaviors that they're doing, and they learn to tolerate anxiety. So at their own pace and in a controlled way, they start to become more comfortable in these situations and stop having such a reduced life. So Leora starts to go back to situations that she's been avoiding. Rix is able to do those presentations again. Critically, these approaches can be highly effective. So for example, about 75% of people will be panic-free at the end of panic control treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy for panic disorder. And the rates are even higher if you look at people who experience symptom improvement. And it's not only cognitive behavioral therapies that are effective. So there's evidence for certain medications helping for mindfulness, interpersonal therapy, among others. So we have a variety of approaches that research says can be helpful. The key, though, is to first try interventions with the best available research support. And I've included a link here where you can see which interventions have good research support for different problem areas. The reason that I'm pushing this idea of research support and evidence-based treatment so much is that our field has a history of not necessarily providing those approaches to individuals. And in fact, sometimes we've provided approaches that have what we call iatrogenic effects, so they can even make people worse. So our guesses about what's likely to be helpful really need to be tested. Yet we do have a lot of research that shows us that we have good treatments to help people with anxiety disorders. And so we need to ask ourselves, why aren't people getting the help that they need? This turns out to be a very complicated problem that's multifaceted. So we know that treatments can be very expensive. Think about Rick who's lost his job. It's going to be very difficult for him to be able to afford these treatments. Logistics can be difficult. So even getting to a provider can be very challenging. Think about Leora, who has trouble traveling now because she has agoraphobia. It can be difficult for her to go out. And stigma. So sadly, there is still stigma about seeking treatment in, in our culture. So Leora, who feels really embarrassed to seek help and only told her primary care physician after five years and no one since, makes it very difficult for her to go out and seek care. And there's limited access to providers, and especially a lack of access to evidence-based treatments. 
So Rick, who lives in a small town, may find it very difficult to even, if he never had the resources, to find someone who could provide evidence-based care for his problem area. You add to this that hallmarks of anxiety disorders are fear and avoidance, and it becomes very difficult for people to go outside of their comfort zone and figure out how to find good care. As a result, people like Alan Kasdan and Stacey Blaze and others have said that if we really want to reduce the burden of mental illness to reach that 50% of the population, we need to consider alternate delivery models for mental health services. So I want to be really clear here. I think individual therapy in a clinician's office is great. I train my students to do it. I do it myself. And I think it's an absolutely critical piece of what clinical psycho psychological science can offer. But I don't think it's going to be enough. So I want to talk about ways that we can enhance our toolbox and have other things that we can offer people so that we don't just wait in our office for people to come to us. Because if we just wait for people to come to us, we are not going to be able to reduce the burden of mental illness. Our wait lists are too long, there aren't enough well-trained providers, and the need is too great. So I want to talk now about the idea of bringing treatment to people directly using computer-based interventions. And I recognize that this idea can seem a little bit crazy on the surface. So many of us are trained that the way that therapy works is through our connection to another person in the therapist's office. But we actually use our computers for all kinds of things that are really quite surprising until we got used to them. So we go online and watch YouTube videos to figure out how to do repairs in our house. We take full courses online now where we don't ever even meet the instructor. Many people are even meeting their spouses online through online dating programs. So it's not really such a crazy idea that we might use computer-based interventions to help meet our mental health needs. The reason that I think this could potentially be exciting is because it can help to address many of the barriers that have made it hard for people to seek care. So we can disseminate these treatments to lots of people via computer at low cost. It solves a lot of the logistic difficulties because people can even do these treatments in their own home. That helps address the problems with stigma as well. And if you don't have good access to providers or people who can do evidence-based treatments, we can try to bring it to them. And this can help people to ultimately overcome their fear and avoidance so that they're able to get the care that they need and return to lives where they're able to meet their full potential. So these computer-based interventions can really break down a lot of these barriers. We're still at early stages of this kind of work, and so I don't want to make overly grand claims, but the initial evaluations have really been quite encouraging. So there are large effect sizes for internet-based cognitive behavioral therapies for anxiety, meaning that when we look at the results of people who get the therapies relative to people who don't, they're really quite impressive. And in fact, for many anxiety treatments, the computer-based interventions often achieve equal results to what you get with in-person therapy. I don't want to pretend, though, that this is a panacea and solves all problems. So there are remaining challenges in this line of work, besides the fact that it's still even at early stages. One is that we can see pretty high rates of dropout for some of these computer-based interventions, especially if you're looking at people's um, consistency in completing treatments at open access websites. And some of these computer-based interventions that are using the cognitive behavioral therapy approaches can still be quite time-consuming. So we still have some of those same logistic challenges that I brought up earlier. And with some of these interventions that are using cognitive behavioral therapies online, we still do see better outcomes with some degree of therapist input. So some of these programs will have therapists making phone calls or doing personalized email or having minimal personal contact while part of the therapy is done online. And I think that's terrific. So I really encourage people to try out these therapies. And I'm really excited about the ability of these computer-based cognitive behavioral therapies to reach people. But I also want to talk about ways we can address these remaining challenges, challenges and add still further to the toolbox. So can we think about interventions that require no therapist input and that aren't quite as time consuming, for example? but still building on this, on this idea of computer-based interventions. To do this, we want to build from what we know, 
And one of the things we know well at this point is that how we interpret situations is key. So how we make sense of information in our environment can change how we feel, how we behave, how we think further about the situation, and how we relate to other people. And we know this is true because we can see it in our daily lives. Consider a simple, albeit a little silly, example. Imagine that it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you're lying in bed fast asleep and you hear a large crash downstairs in the kitchen. What comes to your mind? Well, it's quite likely that you might think that a burglar has broken in. And if you think that a burglar has broken in, you're likely to feel terror, panic. In terms of your behaviors, you might grab a baseball bat or call 911. A whole cascade of reactions that make sense because you interpreted that situation, that crash, as a sign that there was a burglar. But now imagine instead, it's the same situation. You're lying in bed, it's three o'clock in the morning, and you hear that crash. But instead of thinking it's a burglar, this time you think it's a cat because you just got a cute little kitten a couple weeks ago. And while she's very sweet and very cute, she's getting into everything. And so now you think that she probably knocked something over in your kitchen. Now you're likely not pleased. It's three o'clock in the morning and something has just been smashed in your kitchen. But you're not likely to be feeling that sense of terror and panic. And I hope you're not going to grab the bat, uh, baseball bat or call 911. So the way that we interpret a situation leads to entirely different constellations of thoughts and behaviors and reactions. We can apply these same ideas to the problems that Lior, Rick, and so many people with anxiety disorders face. So think about Rick who finds it hard to make presentations because he fears that others are going to evaluate his social performance. So when he stands in front of an audience and the audience is simply looking at him intently, he's probably thinking something along the lines of they think I'm an idiot. And because he tends to make this negative interpretation, because he fears this negative evaluation from others, it has a whole cascade of negative consequences. So he's likely to see social threat everywhere. So when it's ambiguous whether somebody is judging him negatively, he's going to assume that it's a socially threatening situation and that a negative evaluation is occurring. Moreover, he's going to underestimate his social performance. And we know that people with social anxiety routinely assume that they are performing more poorly than they really are. But think how differently Rick would react if instead of interpreting the situation as thinking that he's in, people are thinking he's an idiot, he had the thought, they think this talk is interesting and that's why they're looking at me so intently. One would think that he's now going to respond very differently. Instead of avoiding those presentations at work, he's going to seek out those opportunities and I would argue he may never have lost his job in the first place. Same pattern for Leora, who experiences panic attacks in the context of panic disorder. So when she feels a change in her heart rate, which can happen for all kinds of different reasons, she's likely to think something catastrophic, like I'm having a heart attack. And that's part of a constellation of reactions that we know occur in panic disorder, where people make catastrophic misinterpretations of their bodily sensations. So work from our lab and many others has shown that people with panic disorder are more likely to make these catastrophic misinterpretations if they have panic disorder, and even if they're just vulnerable to panic disorder. So we've shown that people with anxiety sensitivity or a fear of fear, which is a known vulnerability marker for panic disorder, are likely to make these heart attack kinds of interpretations. And critically, not only do these interpretations change over the course of treatment to become less catastrophic, but the extent of change in those catastrophic misinterpretations precedes and predicts the degree of panic symptom reduction that will occur in therapy. So we've shown that the trajectory of change in those catastrophic misinterpretations can predict how much someone will subsequently improve over the course of cognitive behavior therapy. And these kinds of results have led people to say that the change in what people believe and the way they process information is the primary mechanism of change. So if we can get Leora, instead of thinking she's having a heart attack, to think, oh, my heart's probably racing because I ran down the hall, we can dramatically change the course of her anxiety. So what I want to talk about is can we change interpretations directly without traditional therapy as another way to add to this toolbox. To do this, we use approaches from cognitive bias modification. This is a class of approaches that was developed about 10 to 15 years ago that involved changing people's cognitive biases. 
In other words, changing skewed ways of thinking. So cognitive biases just refer to the idea that we have selective ways of processing information, a tendency or habit to see things in a certain light. In the case that I'm talking about, to interpret things in a threatening way. So I want to talk now about some of the work we've been trying to do to do computer-based interpretation training. So if we want to train Leora to respond to ambiguity in a new way, we want to present her with ambiguous situations and shift her typical way of responding. The reason we focus on ambiguity is because that's where we think a lot of the interesting action is. So if something is objectively really, really terrible, we think that people, whether they have panic disorder or not, should interpret that situation negatively. Similarly, if something is objectively really, really wonderful, chances are good that even Leora is going to think it's okay. The trick is that ambiguity is the vast majority of our experience, where there's room to sort of think of it as more positively or more negatively, depending on how one construes a situation. So let's look at that tendency for Leora to get scared by her heart racing. We can present her with an ambiguous situation that looks like this. You're jogging. Your heart starts to beat quickly. This is. Now it's not clear how she's going to interpret that situation. Because she tends to see it negatively, she's likely to think it's dangerous or that something similarly catastrophic. So she's added a very negative interpretation to this ambiguous situation. But what if instead of dangerous, we just change the last word and we replace it with invigorating? Now we've taken that exact same situation, but assigned a positive interpretation to it. The way that we present this in training with these scenarios, which we've modified by important work by Andrew Matthews and Wendy McIntosh, is presenting people with word fragments. So the word is clear, but they have to fill in the missing letter in order to resolve the emotional ambiguity. The reason we do that is it forces people to actually generate the word that's going to assign the positive or negative meaning to the situation. And we think that that's going to help with them elaborating on the processing that we want them to do, this new interpretive style. And then we reinforce that new interpretation with a comprehension question. In this case, is your rapid heartbeat healthy? And notice here that it, the answer to that question is going to change depending on your, whether you've been assigned to do a negative interpretation or a positive interpretation. And we give people tons and tons of practice with lots of different scenarios so that we try to train a new habitual style of interpreting situations. So that instead of making those catastrophic negative interpretations, people start to associate ambiguity with a more benign or positive interpretation style. And we've now done this with lots of different anxious populations. And what we see is that across these different populations, when people are presented with novel ambiguous situations, they learn to assign these more positive, uh, non-threatening interpretations. So we've done this with people who have spider fear, people with anxiety sensitivity, that fear of fear that makes people vulnerable to panic disorder, people who have obsessional thinking in the context of obsessive compulsive disorder, and people with social anxiety disorder including youth with social anxiety disorder and their parents. And we've even done it with people with contamination fears. And in all of these cases, what we see is that we can shift people's interpretation style to be less threatening just by doing these computer-based programs with no therapist contact whatsoever. Let me show you an example in a little more depth to try to bring this to life. This is a study that we did recently that was led by my former doctoral student, Sherry Steinman, where we compared cognitive bias modification, this interpretation training, to exposure therapy. Now, exposure therapy is the current gold standard treatment um, for height phobia or for alcophobia, the disorder we were working on. And it involves helping people to enter situations that they've previously been avoiding and to do it in a more controlled way so that they get used to the situations and find out that nothing terrible is actually going to happen and then the anxiety will come down on its own. Now exposure therapy works really well and I use it myself with clients but it tends to be a tough sell. So when people find out that the therapy is going to involve re-entering situations that you've been desperately avoiding because they scare you so much that doesn't sound too appealing to a lot of people. So depending on what study you look at you see that anywhere from 25 percent to 90 percent of people either refuse the treatment outright or drop out of treatment. 
So we think exposure therapy is terrific, but we wanted to see if we could think about adding alternative approaches so that there might be other options for people. So everybody who came in was high in symptoms of height fear or acrophobia, and we assigned them to one of four intervention conditions. All of the intervention conditions were uh, two one and a half hour sessions. So everybody got the same total dose of treatment, but the, the interventions differed. They could either be assigned to an interpretation training only condition, an exposure only condition, a combo condition where half the time was spent doing interpretation training and half was spent doing exposure, or a control condition. And I'll go through each of these to give you some sense of what they looked like. So those in the interpretation training condition saw a series of these ambiguous scenarios like the one I showed you in the context of panic, but they were specific to height situations and whether these situations were dangerous or the person could tolerate their anxiety and cope in that situation. For example, you're standing on the edge of a balcony of a 10-story building. You realize the railings are shorter than they are on most balconies. The chances of you falling are still and now we present a word fragment that the person has to resolve to assign an emotional meaning to the situation. So in this case, it's minimal. So we present the idea that the situation is actually safe and the person is not likely to, not, not likely to fall. Now notice it's not ambiguous whether the person was in a height situation. What's critical is the ambiguity about the emotional meaning that the person assigns to the situation. We reinforce this meaning that we've assigned with a comprehension question where we ask, are you likely to fall off the balcony? And here the answer would be no. So people did a whole bunch of these kinds of scenarios. Because they were doing two one and a half hour sessions, we thought they would go a little crazy doing just these scenarios. We also added in an additional form of interpretation called interpretation modification paradigm that's modified by an approach that Beard, uh, Courtney Beard and Nadir Amir have developed. So that's interpretation training. For exposure therapy, we had trained graduate level therapists take our participants to heights of all around our campus and they did two sessions of exposure therapy where we had a fear hierarchy and they gradually exposed themselves to these situations that they found really frightening and tried to remain in these situations so that they could learn that nothing terrible happened and the anxiety would come down. For those who were assigned to the control condition, they did a computer-based training that looked very, very similar to the active training, but was missing the crucial ingredients. So for these individuals, they also read little scenarios and filled in word fragments to finish the scenarios, but there was no emotional ambiguity. So these scenarios were actually quite boring, were not related to fear, and most weren't related to heights. So for example, you're reading one night when you come across a word that you do not know, you decide to look up the word, you go get your and they'd resolve it with dictionary and then have a question just to make sure they were paying attention. Do you look up a definition? Most of these were not related to heights. We made a quarter of them have some kind of a height context, even though there was no sort of emotional ambiguity involved, just to make it a little bit more credible so that people would complete the conditions. And we chose to have a control here that matched the computer training because that was really the novel component in the study. Exposure therapy had really been tested before. So here's what we expected. Our hypotheses were that all three active conditions, whether it was interpretation training, exposure only, or their combination, would beat the control condition and show improvement on all the different outcome measures. We thought there would be therapeutic synergy. So we thought that we might see the largest treatment gains in that combined condition. The logic being that if you did some interpretation training and stopped making such catastrophic negative interpretations, you might be willing to do more in exposure and get more of that. In turn, if you did some exposures and had an increase in your self-efficacy self because you found that you could tolerate your anxiety and stay in these situations, we thought you might then see them as less threatening and not make such negative interpretations. So let me show you what happened. We had about nine or 10 outcome measures and in the interest of time, I'm just gonna show you kind of our top three and the results were very similar across lots of different measures so that you can kind of get an idea of what happened. So one question we can ask is whether an intervention like this, where you're sitting in front of a computer and just filling in these word fragments, can that change the way you make sense of subsequent situations? So the interpretations you assign in new situations. So on the Heights Interpretation Questionnaire, what we see is that our four groups were very similar to each other in making threatening interpretations at the start of the intervention, 
But following the intervention, all three of our active treatment groups came down similarly and are now significantly lower than the control group in gray. So notice here that our three active treatments all do pretty much the same. So our therapeutic synergy hypothesis was not supported. What we see instead is that cognitive, the, um, pardon me, the interpretation training therapy is equal to the gold standard exposure therapy. They, all three of those conditions did equally well. And it's the same thing when we look at our other outcome measures. So on the acrophobia questionnaire, which is a standard measure of outcome for treatment for hypophobia, we see same kind of results when we look at the drop in anxiety symptoms. All three of the active groups do much better in terms of a reduction in their anxiety symptoms, and they're now all significantly beating the control condition and look similar to each other. Same thing when we look at drops in avoidance behavior. So what we're seeing here is that this computer-based training can do just as well as the exposure therapy in leading to symptom reduction. We also wanted to look at what the mechanism of this interpretation training is. In other words, what's allowing it to have its effects? How is it working? And what we see is that when we did tests of cognitive mediation, we find that it's that through the change in interpretations that the interpretation training condition is exerting its effects and leading to the reduction in anxiety symptoms. So what I've told you so far is that we see good evidence that interpretation biases are strongly associated with anxiety and that these biases can change over the course of the treatment. Moreover, not only do they change, but the work that I've shown you with cognitive bias modification shows a causal link. That change in interpretations can causally reduce anxiety and avoidance behavior. And we're excited about this line of work because it suggests that we may have a means that can help to overcome the many barriers that exist to disseminating evidence-based care. At the same time, though, there is still a long ways to go if we want to fully help Leora and Rick. So we know that we have inconsistent transfer from interpretation change to symptom change. So all the results I told you for those studies are true. We've been able to change people's interpretations. And in pretty much every case, we're also able to change symptoms to some extent or change some kind of aspect of their emotional reactions. But we can't change it across the board. So we typically sort of see that two out of three outcomes change. So we need to figure out why that's the case and how to make these interventions stronger so that they can more reliably shift people's symptoms and avoidance behavior. And we have to figure out how it works better to do that or why it sometimes fails so that we can understand the boundary conditions. I put up the picture of the toilet there because we had a study that used a totally different type of training that I'm talking about today that really didn't work at all. And so the picture of the toilet is because it was a study with people with contamination fears, but it also shows our results pretty well on that one. So we think that if we want to better understand how these interventions work we, and strengthen their effects, we need to move from the lab to the real world because that will allow us to get bigger samples. If we don't just conduct these studies in the laboratory, we'll be able to get larger groups of people if we do these in treatments online, for example, and then we can simultaneously test the dissemination potential. So now I want to talk a little bit about what's next. What are some of the approaches that we're trying to do now to try to improve these interventions and think about whether they can be disseminated widely once we can make these improvements. So one approach is to try to train healthy thinking about the future. So all the training programs that I we've done and that I've showed you have really focused on training how people interpret past or present situations. But if you think about Rick and what was getting in the way, he was just avoiding going to do those presentations whatsoever. So he wasn't willing to go do things that were scheduled for the future because of the fear that he was experiencing. Similarly, Leora was just not going out. So in reinterpreting past situations is probably going to help her somewhat, but we also want to change what she expects is likely to happen in the future. And with an award from the Templeton Foundation, we're testing a new training program that's trying to shift these interpretations about the future. And this will be delivered online. Similarly, we're trying to see if we can improve the current training. So we have lots of ideas about what could make training programs stronger. So we're doing a proof of principle study where we're going to launch shortly that's testing 16 variations online. 
So we have variations that are trying to enhance cognitive flexibility, so to make people be able to think and take different perspectives in new ways. We have tweaks to the intervention, the interpretation training intervention, that try to enhance imagery more effectively so that people will get more immersed in the scenarios. And that's based on important evidence from Emily Holmes and others that enhancing imagery can really improve our results. We have tweaks to the interpretation training that try to improve people's mindfulness so that they're more present in the intervention and in viewing these situations in a less judgmental way. And then we have tweaks to the interventions that are designed to enhance the emotional transfer. So the extent that you go from making this cognitive change to in making less threatening interpretations to having this have an emotional impact. So that's a proof of principle study where it's just one session and we're trying lots of different variations. One of the other things we're doing that we're really excited about is trying to take the full interpretation training programs online. So for the past few years, we've been directing a website called Project Implicit Mental Health. And this is a website where people can come and do tests of cognitive biases associated with lots of different mental health issues. And we've been fortunate that this site gets a lot of website traffic. So we've been had over 350,000 tasks completed at the site. And people come to this site and they do measures of their automatic associations in memory, a form of cognitive bias, across lots of different mental health domains. And you can go to this website and try it out yourselves or have your uh, clients try it out. So it's got associations for depression, self-esteem, alcohol, eating, lots of different areas, including anxiety critically. And because we have a large um, number of people coming to the site, it creates a really lovely opportunity for recruitment. So right now the site has just been offering assessments, but many of the people who come to the site are high in anxiety symptoms. And so what we're getting ready to launch now is an interpretation training arm to the site, where we invite people who are high in symptoms or high in these cognitive biases to do an online interpretation training study. So we're soon getting ready to launch a new program that we've called Mind Trails, which is supported by a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health, where people can come and participate in research studies where we can train them to do these new, less threatening interpretation training styles. So hopefully I'll be able to come back soon and tell you about the results of these new lines of work. But for now, I want to close by encouraging you to tell your Aunt Leora's and tell your best friend's Rick's to go and seek help for the problems that they're dealing with and to ask for evidence-based care. So programs that help, that help them to change the ways they think about situations so they're making less negative interpretations. For programs that help them to reduce their avoidance behavior so that they can stop making their lives so small and re-enter the situations that they've been avoiding and learn to tolerate anxiety. Because of course, the paradox is that as soon as you learn to tolerate anxiety, you stop having so much anxiety. So right now, we need to tell them to go and seek evidence-based care. But my hope is that very, very soon, we'll be in a good position to bring that care to them. And so that they, from the comfort of their own home, will be able to complete training programs online that will help them to reduce their anxiety and to live more fulfilling lives. And I wanna thank you for your attention to this work and thank the funding agencies that have supported this research, our collaborators, and most of all, my current team that makes doing this research so much fun. And thank you for this opportunity to participate in the SSCP Virtual Clinical Lunch Series.